We are now officially recording and we are going live on YouTube. Okay, great. Thank you, Nelly. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Maria Ortiz, co-chair of Housing, Health and Human Services, and this is our monthly meeting. Um, and our agenda and the materials for tonight's meeting are on the website, the Manhattan Community Board 4 website. Um, the meeting is being recorded, just so you're all aware, on YouTube, it's live streaming. Um, everyone's going to stay muted throughout the meeting, um, except for whoever is speaking. After the presentation, committee will have an opportunity to ask questions or comment, and then members of the public who are identified as attendees on Zoom can ask questions or comment. Uh, sometimes what we do is on some items after the public comment, there's a discussion again among committee members, and then we um, we vote to write a letter of recommendation or support, uh, a letter of recommendation or for support on a, a topic. Um, can you all see me okay? Give me one second. That might be better. And let's see, the last thing I want to remind everyone. Oh, yes. So for attendees, uh, in order to speak on a topic, you're going to have to raise your hand. You'll see it on the screen. Um, and if you're on the phone, you have to press star nine to raise your hand. Star six is to mute and unmute. Um, are there any questions so far, tech questions, from any of the attendees? Okay, good. There are none. So first, I'm going to switch up the agenda. Tonight on the agenda, we're supposed to have a committee discussion on homelessness. Um, the Ryan Chelsea Center is supposed to speak, and then we're going to um, discuss the third item, uh, budget priorities for fiscal year 2022. So what we're going to do first, I'm going to switch it up a little, just waiting for Joe to jump on. So I'm going to have Ryan Chelsea Health Center speak first. They're doing a presentation. And um, Will, I see that you are on. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, just waiting for Dan Pitchinson, who's going to be presenting, to come. So he should be on any second. So can Will or Charlene begin the presentation, and then Dan will jump sure. in wherever you guys are? Sure, I can that would start. Be great. Will, can we see your beautiful face, please? Okay, give me one second. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's that? Okay. Um, hold on, I just lost the screen. All right, there we are. Okay, if we could just start, I guess. Um, so, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, William Arvaleda. I'm the deputy director of the Ryan Chelsea Clinic Community Health Center. Uh, we've been serving the community since 2001. Um, currently, uh, we are open. We have been open throughout the pandemic, serving the community. 70% uh, of the patients that come to our center uh, reside in CB4 or around CB4. Uh, we are a mid-sized health center with about 11 to 12,000 registered patients. Last year, we had 43,000 uh, unique visits. Um, our payer mix is uh, approximately 55% Medicare, another 20%, uh, I'm sorry, Medicaid, 20% medi Medicare, 15% um, self-pay, which are uninsured, and then the rest is um, private insurance. Uh, the mission of the Ryan Health, if you want to go to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, Ryan Chelsea Clinton is a sub-recipient or a, an affiliate of the Ryan Network, Ryan Health, which started in 1967, which was established to meet the need for healthcare services on the Upper West Side of Manhattan as part of the war on poverty and the greater healthcare movement. Uh, community Health Center started in the mid to late 60s. First one was in Mississippi, uh, rural health being the focus, and then in Boston, and we were the third. Um, like I said, today we are a network of health centers across Manhattan. Actually, we just had a ribbon cutting today for our new site up in Washington Heights, Ryan Wadsworth. So that's great. So like I said, Ryan, Ryan Chelsea Clinton was founded in 2001. If you want to go um, to the next slide. 
Oh, hello? Can you hear me? Hello? You can hear me. Okay. So I said, as I said before, uh, our mission is uh, to provide high quality, affordable, comprehensive, and linguistically appropriate healthcare services to the medically underserved, uh, providing high quality healthcare to those with regardless of their ability to pay. You can go to the next slide. Um, we are a leader in the community health center movement. As you see by the, the photo there, during the pandemic, we were open. Uh, Senator Brad Hoylman was generous enough to donate us. Those are about 10,000 masks, which we have uh, been, our staff and patients have been using. Um, we're still going through those. You can continue. Next slide. Um, as I said, uh, regarding, you can go next, regardless of the, everybody's ability to pay. So basically, actually talking about that, you can stay on this slide. Um, we, we serve everybody regardless of their ability to pay. That means if you don't have insurance, you're put on a sliding fee scale, which uh, means that you can pay as little as $35 per visit or as much as $105 visit, depending on your income and family size. Our hours of operation are Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, 8.30 to 7, Wednesdays and Fridays, 8.30 to 4.30, and we're also open on alternating Saturdays. You can go to the next slide. So um, these are some measures during this time uh, that we keep uh, everyone safe at our centers from our staff to our patients. So we follow CDC recommendations, all patients, visitors, and staff entering the center must wear a face mask or face covering. We also do pre-screening for COVID, asking the essential questions, checking to see if anybody's been to any states that they need to be quarantined in. And they're also checked for temperatures and symptoms. If somebody is showing a, you know, answering uh, appropriately for these questions, they get put into a, a screening, into a, an isolation room where they're having further screenings. Um, we also ask all of our, everyone coming into the center to use proper hand hygiene, which is to use uh, hand sanitizer upon entry. You can go to the next. Um, we have visitor limitations. So basically one adult is allowed to accompany a patient for a visit. Uh, one parent can accompany, accompany a pediatric patient and no other visitors are allowed. We have screens, which I'll show you next, uh, partitions to help with social distancing and making sure everybody's six feet away. Um, we do constant cleaning and disinfecting of the center throughout the day. And again, we, we, uh, we adhere to social distancing. We also have staff working from home so as to not to burden, you know, have staff too close together. Obviously the layout of the site did not take social distancing into account back in 2001. So. Um, we have those who can work from home, do work from home, either alternating or on an ongoing basis. One example is our social workers um, are doing everything via telehealth and they've actually been more, more productive and, and seen more patients through televideo and telephonic visits. You can go to the next slide, please. As you can see there, I don't know if any of you have been to our center, but it used to be a really open and, and airy and roomy place. Um, now we've had to partition them. So those are all six feet apart we've, um, with all the chairs six feet apart. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, as I talked about before, uh, in Mar back in April, when uh, folks were quarantining or staying home or afraid to go out, uh, Ryan's Health instituted telehealth. So um, all co-pays and uh, for 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 these telehealth visits have been waived and they are actually we are getting full reimbursement from the government until uh 2021 right now so video conferencing with your provider works similar to in-person visits um they review your medical history and you can basically have uh basically i'm sorry uh, we're, we're continuing with, with treatment plan. Obviously, there are some aspects of, of the visit that are inapplicable uh, during telehealth, but you can do follow-ups, you can have discussions, um, and all you need is a private or semi-private setting, a good internet connection, desktop computer, and one of these operating systems. Uh, you can go ahead, next. And then here is a uh, way to, to make the appointment. You can call 749-1820 or go through the MyPair portal account. Uh, to register as a patient. I can go to the next one. So these are the current services we currently provide. Um, anything from primary care to from adults to adolescents. We have pediatrics, women's health. We have two dentists who are amazing. We have a full eye clinic. We have case management depending on certain chronic diseases. Uh, we have 
you know, various specialties on site. We have, you know, nutrition. We do PrEP and PEP and HIV services. We do have STI. We have COVID-19 antibody testing available. Um, we currently do not have uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs, uh, only in the case of, of a pre-op uh, visit. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, as I said before, we do have antibody testing available at Ryan. Uh, any questions regarding COVID antibody testing? Or should we just wait till the end? Okay, gotcha. You're muted, but I, I understood you're muted. All right, next slide. Um, we also offer at-home HIV testing, uh, which started out really slow. So basically, you call this number and we will send uh, an email to prep, you know, or you can send an email to prep at ryanhealth.org and your response within 24 hours. We'll send you a free HIV test through the mail and you have it and, or pick it up at, at one of our sites and uh, send it to an at-home kit, return it and you'll get a, and you'll get a result. Um, it started out very slow. I think we did about one or two a month and now we're doing about five to 10 a week. So it's, it's very good. All right, next slide. Uh, we do have pediatric vaccinations available. Um, one of the measures that has uh, decreased throughout the pandemic are vaccinations. So it's very important for children to stay up to date in order to stay healthy. So if anybody, you know anybody who needs uh, pediatric vaccinations, please have them come to the center. Next slide. Uh, behavioral health integration. So uh, Ryan uh, Chelsea Clinton uses a collaborative care model where the provider, uh, a social worker, and a psychiatrist uh, discuss the patient's needs. We offer depression screenings uh, to talk about the uh, behavioral health conditions. We do short-term therapy as well as medication management. So the collaborative model helps to ensure that patients get all the care they need. And if they need you know, something more than short-term care, the psychiatrist will sort of do a case conference and uh, suggest longer-term care and refer them to another facility. Next question, next slide. Uh, we are also, Ryan Chelsea Clinton also uh, participates in the city's MAT program, which is Medication Assistant Treatment. So uh, there's Dr. Siddiqui, our medical director. Um, she provides uh, buprenorphine, which is a non-addictive, uh, non-addictive, I'm sorry, uh, non-addictive treatment for uh, opioid addiction. Um, patients are screened. Uh, they do a short-term brief intervention referral to treatment, um, and then they are seen they're eligible. If they are too uh, much in the in the in the throes of addiction, they get they get referred to a to a rehabilitation. But if they can uh, take buprenorphine if they're eligible and if they're um, deemed the right fit, then they are on this regimen and they visit the provider once a week, and they uh, it's a good way for them to get off. And they also, it's also part of the clinical setting. Next slide. Uh, we have a geriatric program. Uh, we have behavioral health support for patients who are 55 and over. We have a social worker who specializes in, um, in, in older adults. Uh, we also have a patient advocate dedicated to helping them with their social determinants of health, whether it be transportation, whether it's nutrition, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's being in a social setting and helping them integrate into that. Um, next slide. We also have a robust HIV services program where we offer pri HIV primary care by HIV specialists. We do rapid testing on site for free. Uh, you don't need, uh, all you need is an ID. You don't even need to be a patient and you get results within 20 minutes. For those who are getting HIV care who are eligible, we do over, offer case management services who will wrap around everything for social services, housing, transportation, food, and such. Uh, we are part of the city's Undetectables Incentive Program, which helps folks, uh, which is an incentive program for folks who are undetectable, uh, who are living with HIV who are undetectable to get a, a monetary incentive every three months. We also offer PrEP and PEP services. We currently have 300 patients who are in PrEP who are on PrEP. And then uh, we, well, before the pandemic, we did have, we were targeting priority populations with outreach and engagement events throughout uh, the neighborhood and the city. Next slide. Uh, we also have a robust cancer screening program. We have a grant dedicated 
uh, to increasing our cancer rates. We have a dedicated patient navigator, technical assistant in training, and we, have, we are part of the state's uh, cancer screening program, which provides uninsured patients over the age of 40 with free cancer screenings. And uh, actually today we had our Mount Sinai mammogram van. I think we saw over 25, pa over 25 patients receive mammograms in front of the center today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have another patient navigator who is dedicated to helping our patients receive benefits. That includes SNAP, health insurance, cash assistance, lifeline phones, and other public benefits, and connecting um, our patients to these services is very important. So in assistance, you know, what we recognize is that in, assistance to, in, ass in addition to clinical services and primary care services we provide, as I'll point out later on, um, the social determinants of health uh, transportation, education, food insecurity are just important to somebody's health as, as, as them getting a checkup every year. So we have um, identified that need and applied for grants or provided resource or obtained resources to help uh, with patient navigation for all of our patients. Next slide, please. So here is a prepare screening, as I was discussing before, the social determinant of helps, right? So what goes into your health? There are many different factors, right? Uh, job status, education, uh, supports, income, um, as well as the physical environment you live in. Other things like health behaviors, right? So how you eat, uh, any addictions you might have, your sexual activity, uh, and as well as your access to care. These are all go into uh, how healthy you are, how healthy you can be. So we've developed, or we, uh, we, we offer these prepare screenings to help us identify these needs in all of our patients. Because somebody could be, you know, could really have, want to be healthy or want to have, uh, take part in becoming their healthy selves, but there's many barriers that we want to identify and help work on and, and provide assistance for. Can you go to the next slide? Um, so, Again, PREPARE stands for Protocol for Responding and Assessing Patient Assets, Risks, and Experiences, right? So it's a screening tool to assess a patient's social determinants of health, right, as discussed before. Uh, our, our outreach team and our patient navigators connect the patients to community resources within their zip code. Um, we do these surveys during a patient's visit or during our outreach calls. And um, right now we are piloting with outreach to any hypertensive, high blood pressure patients uh, right now, and then once uh, we determine the success of the program, we'll expand it to the general patient population. Next slide. As I discussed before, patient navigators are, are very one of you know is are a very vital cog to the success of our patients being healthy and living healthy lives. Um, between July and September of two thousand of this year, we've had five hundred and thirty two unique out uh, patients. Uh, who have been touched by our navigators? Uh, what we've what we've what we've come to the conclusion of that care coordination with external agencies uh, is important and vital to get these patients connected to the resources that we as a health center, uh, community health center, can can offer. Right. So, you know, uh, home health. Uh, so you know, uh, working with other agencies such as you know housing agency, we work well with you know. Uh, breaking ground, uh, housing conservation coordinators, and make referrals for the services that the patients need. We also connect folks with, with health insurance, uh, applying through the marketplace, and as well as I said before, SNOOP, uh, uh, SNAP and, and, and pantries in the neighborhood. Uh, other services that we, that we provide include trans arranging transportation, we have, a le we have legal services, we have a, um, a lawyer coming once a month to one of our sites, and uh, to help them with, with housing and other types of uh, you know, immigration law, not criminal law. Um, also providing assistance and support, as I talked just before, from phones to referrals to behavioral health, nutritionists, employment assistance and such. Go to the next slide. Um, this is something I'm not aware of. Uh, Charlene, do you wanna talk about the Here For You platform? Charlene on the line? Did you, is she unmuted? Oh, okay, sorry, now I'm, I'm unmuted. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, okay, so we're on the slide on the, the collaboration with Breaking Ground and the Molina? No, we're not there yet. Uh, we're on the oh, Here for okay. platform launch, the one before that. 
Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I, I, I didn't have it. Pulled up, uh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, sure. So I can talk a little bit about the, the here for you. So um, on there, we uh, based the platform off of Mount Bertha and patients are able to enter in their zip code and it'll give them the resources in their area that they're most interested in. Um, so far uh, from our QI department, we've had about 400 or so searches. Um, and the most popular things that people were looking for was connection to housing, uh, food security, um, as well as uh, health insurance uh, connections. So we've been able to, um, to reach out to people who've used that platform and follow up with them and see if they were actually connected to those services on site. Great. All right, we can go to the next slide. Star Charlene, actually. So Charlene is our community relations yeah. coordinator and she's her, she's tasked with outreaching to the neighborhood to strengthen existing relationships, create new ones. So she's gonna talk about community outreach right now. Yeah, uh, so I mentioned this uh, earlier today in our, in our other meeting, um, but we've uh, started a new collaboration with Breaking Ground and we've been using our mobile unit and visiting different uh, areas or different hotspots um, in Midtown um, and kind of closer to Chelsea area. So places where there's high rates of homelessness, um, reported uh, high instances of substance use, um, as well as people who are accessing free meal services through local churches and, and other pantries. Um, and with pairing with Breaking Ground, uh, we're able to visit those locations, have direct contact with a lot of the individuals, provide services like blood, uh, blood pressure screenings, glucose screenings. Um, we've done a lot of flu vaccinations within the last few weeks. Um, we successfully connected a new patient to um, care on site, um, as well as enrolled two new people into our MAP program. Um, so that's an ongoing outreach effort that we're looking to continue with breaking ground and potentially also bridging um, more connections with other organizations that are doing uh, similar types of work within our neighborhood. So thank you, Charlie. So the, the we have a mobile medical van that, that goes out and does all these, all the, provides all these services as Charlene said. And um, it's a, you know, it goes to Hudson Guild, Breaking Ground has been a, a, a tremendous partner for us. Um, you know, bringing, you know, we brought the van to the people, or bringing the people to us. And this is a great way how we can help the community beyond the four walls of, of the center. Um, next slide. So, uh, I will. I just want to give a shout out to our team because throughout the pandemic, they they were coming to work. You know, a, a lot of them got infected, had to be out, stay out for two weeks, and came back healthy and ready to go. Uh, we really did not know in March and April, you know, what the what the next day was going to bring. Were there going to be throws of people coming to get tested? Was nobody going to show up? Um, but one constant was that our staff was ready. Uh, willing and able, you know, to take care of the community, and uh, you know, I just want to, I just want to applaud their efforts, um, you know, uh, for them coming in and, and taking care. And now that you know we've gotten back to our, uh, you know, we've gotten back to our pretty much our pre-COVID levels as far as as visits. I mean, eighty percent of our visits are in person now. Um, telehealth is about twenty percent, although we'd like to keep telehealth in order just to maintain, just to make sure not too many, you know, not we don't get too many people in the center for, for social distancing reasons. Next slide. Um, yeah, and these are just some of the accolades. Uh, you know, we've gotten awards and we are Joint Commission certified and we are certified uh, level three patient-centered medical home. I think that's it, right? Yeah, any questions? I think Dan is, is on the line now too, somewhere. Hi, sorry that I'm having a Wi-Fi trouble. I'm, I'm the executive director. I know Will one was very thorough, so I just want to tell the community board members, get your flu shot, get your flu shot, get your flu shot, tell your friends and family, get your flu shot. So we're going to, we're uh, developing a partnership with uh, New York City Department of Health, mental hygiene. We're probably going to open up the center for about eight Saturdays that we're not usually open and just do mass flu shots for the, um, for the neighborhood. So more to come on that. Thank you, Dan. It's actually preparation for when there's a, a COVID-19 vaccine is there's many channels that the vaccine will flow through and one is through federally qualified health centers such as us. So we're using the flu shot, the flu season 
as a dry run for when the vaccine is ready to vaccine to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. So, um, so to, it's, it's two. One is good public health, and one is strategy for for getting through the pandemic when it's time. So I was having um, that issue, but thanks for having us. Thank you, Dan. Um, it's fine that you had some trouble. Will Will got it. Um, <laughs> you did good, Will. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions before we go to the uh, the rest of the committee members. Right, Dan, don't um, go away. Yeah, and Charlene and Dan stay. Um, uh, also, I, I forgot, I'm sorry. I wanted to mention that on the attendee side, we also have, I noticed we have Emily Bart, I forgot your last name, Emily, I'm so sorry. Uh, Emily Bartisek from Linda Rosenthal's office, and we have Jordan, who is from the speaker's office. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Um, also, great collaboration with Breaking Ground on doing that. Um, just some quick questions. Did you say 25% Medicaid, Will? No, no, uh, 50, 55%. Oh, uh, 50 to 55% Medicaid, oh, Medicaid managed 50 care. 50 to 55. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And then um, uh, I was curious about the trends that you're seeing um, related to COVID, if, if you have that kind of data or information. So, Dan, you want to take that one? Yeah, so, um, sorry, did I unmute myself or did I mute myself? No, you're good. We hear you. We hear you. <laughs> um, so, in terms of, um, if you're asking about like COVID um, antibodies, uh, seroprevalent, we offer that for our patients and, and if you become a patient. So, right now we're about, um, at our center, about 21%, which is kind of what that, what the rate is for Manhattan. So, in general, a little bit higher than for what the the west side is um so but we but as as people know COVID 19 has been disproportionately impacting uh individuals from communities of color individuals who have less access to uh things to overcome social determinants of health so health center patients are more likely to have covid than uh, individuals with private doctors um, we've seen uh, higher rates of screening for uh depression and anxiety um, which is being seen around the world, really, nationally. Um, so we're, uh, our social workers, as well said, have uh, ever been busier, and we're, we're still uh, trying to um, direct people to the appropriate uh, care. We, we've reached out to Fountain House and also um, uh, Hudson Guild a little bit. Thank you. Um, and you said 21%. You're talking about, I'm sorry, you were saying the number of, of people who are getting COVID testing? Uh, uh, antibodies? No, yeah, twenty-one percent of people who have had, had an antibody test at our center, which is several thousands now, um, came back positive. Meaning that at some point, that they, uh, according to science, at least as we understand it now, which is that they at some point were either had COVID, they were exposed to COVID, whether they had symptoms or not. Um, that's not to say that the negatives. I mean, they're still up to debate whether you can have had it and be negative. Right. right. Um, yeah. the, the other thing you just mentioned about the higher rate, your screenings, you're seeing higher rates of depression and anxiety. Um, I actually had a question about that. How Your behavioral health staff, how many do you have in your behavioral health staff again? We have about um, three and a half F FTE, like three and a half social workers. Um, what about psychiatrists? Psychiatrists, we do not have at our own center. We're actually... Um, going to be engaging in conversations with Fountain House around it. Um, but we, in our network, we have psychiatrists um, that are uh, 96, I'm sorry, 100th in Amsterdam. So we can make referrals up there. But there's, there's, a, um, there's a shortage of psychiatry in community setting. So there's kind of a wait list, which is unfortunate. Yeah. And um, so the, our, our, our providers also, you know, our, our, we do have a social worker on site once a day at least you know there's one social worker on site they do a rotation and they do you know we do they do our providers and our navigators do warm handoffs um to ensure you know uh transition to care continuity of care um, we also do virtual warm handoffs also as well and are you seeing any trends i'm curious i don't know if you would have this data either but are you seeing any trends related to homelessness you know that's a big issue for us in the community right now mm -hmm. Um, 
I mean, we seem, we're seeing more homeless people or who identify as homeless at, at registration. I mean, both of it is because of um, the use of the hotels in the, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we have not really seen an uptake in in current, pa in, in long-term pa or patients who are registered pre-COVID experiencing um, homelessness yet. Okay. And- I, I think uh, that's the lack of eviction, you know, the no eviction. So that's why we haven't really seen that yet. Um, and the social determinants of health screening. I think you already mentioned this. I was, my thought was when you were speaking about it, if there was anything significant to see before that you were seeing when you were doing that screening. But it, I'm curious, it sounds, you know, the thing is, I did hear you talk about the Here For You platform, and it sounds like housing, food security, and insurance are the, the main things, but I was curious when you're doing that other screening, if there's Oh, the prepare screening? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't really, I have to get back to you on that. Again, we're, we're in the pilot stage right now, so we're just focusing on folks who have hyper, who have high blood pressure. If you give us... Yeah, I can get back to you with some data on that. Yeah, I would appreciate it. Yeah, just follow, follow up with me tomorrow or early next week. And, and, and you know, I can either A, get you, to, get you the information or I can connect you to Sharmista, who is our uh, population health manager. Okay, thank you. And my last question, um, are you seeing an increase in people coming in getting their flu shots compared to last oh, year? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, good. And also, also it's... Um, we're, we're not, we last, uh, you know, since I've been at Ryan Chelsea, we, we've had just, you could just walk in off the street and anybody can get there. Well, we did have like flu shot hours, like, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, but we never turned away. If somebody wanted to get a flu shot, you know, they can just come in outside of those hours. Now you have to make an appointment. There's just, we just don't have the capacity to, you know, to get, you know, anybody just coming in. We, you know, we encourage everybody who comes in for a visit or physical to get their flu shot then. But you can come in, but you have to make an appointment to get your flu shot, uh, just because the demand is so great. I mean, we're lucky also to be part of this a city program, uh, vaccines for adults, which provides free vaccines or low cost vaccines for adults who are uninsured. So we do have a nurse, a registered nurse who's dedicated just yes. to do that, and okay. and you know the vaccines, and you know he's been invaluable this flu season because he's okay. just doing flu shots all day. Okay. and all night if we, if we were open. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so let's go, I'm gonna go around the room um, on my screen and see if anyone has any questions. Judith, you are the person <laughs> right next to me. No questions, comments, concerns? Okay, Betty? Okay, Leslie Williams. Yeah, I had one concern. Uh, are you, is your funding being affected by COVID at all? How secure is, is your organization in terms of funding? Dan, do you want me to take that? I don't know where Dan went. Did Dan leave? He's back. He's back. Did you want to, you want me to answer that question or do you have it? I don't, oh, the question is from uh, Mr. Williams. He says, uh, he asks, uh, has our funding been affected? due to the pandemic? Um, so I'll take that one. So, so uh, yes. So um, while, this, while the state is, is reimbursing for telehealth in ways that it never did before, is that, so we have certain programs that are grant funded by the state of New York. When we, the state is withholding 20% of everything that we have, that they owe us. So um, they say it's due to, uh, they're managing the state the health department's cash flow. So we are now delivering 100% of the services and getting 80% back on certain state grants around HIV uh, cancer screening. So we are optimistic that the health the department will make good and send us our, I mean, we have to, yes. So we are praying that the state will give us the money that we, that they, that we are owed. Pete, you are, Leslie, that's it? Yeah, I, I have a question. I, I'm wondering uh, the number of um, unemployed uh, persons uh, coming into the office, your office. Um, um, 
versus what you had last year prior to the covert? Or, uh, are you seeing an uptick on that? An increase in, in the number of uh, unemployed people who so, once had their own private doctor and now no longer have them? So we're seeing up, uh, it's, it's just in the last two or three months, we're starting to see an uptick in uh, people with Medicaid. So we're primarily in Medicaid, but we see the number of individuals with Medicaid growing and the numbers with in, uh, private insurance, so to speak, declining. So that would tend to um, go to your point is that people who pri previously had uh, primary, uh, private insurance are now um, accessing Medicaid benefits. So, um, and we're trying to tell people and, and, we're, and we would encourage the community board too, if you know people who lost their job and don't have insurance or need access or recently obtained Medicaid, tell them to come to us if they live in the neighborhood. Please, or go to the nearest tracking well? we, We're tracking the number of, of visits that are, yeah. So, yeah, Medicaid versus. The Medicare individuals that are now Medicaid. Sorry, um, I missed that one. Yeah, I mean, we, we, track, we track the payer mix. So how many folks? You know, and, and we've seen a, a, an increase uh, over, like Dan said, over the past couple of months of more folks that Medicaid. That's the that's the best, the most accurate barometer of folks who, you know, uh, who are struggling financially, right? If they had private insurance before, if they're no longer, you know, if they've become self-pay or uninsured, you know, that, that is, that's a good barometer. I think what happened is when people were furloughed, many people were able to keep their insurance during that time period. But as furloughs turn into something more permanent, then, then it goes from uh, furlough to layoff, and that's when people start to lose their insurance. And some people will use money to carry on with COBRA to maintain it. But then after fun, you know, it gets very tough. You do I pay my bills? Do I pay my COBRA to try to keep my insurance? It's, it's a very challenging decision individuals make. And you know, please, if you know people who need health and health care, send them to us or their nearest community health center. Yes. And next would be Jessica. Sorry about that background noise. Hi, thank you. And um, I want to just acknowledge um, how difficult and challenging it must be to continue to work or to have worked during the pandemic. Uh, I also work for a nonprofit that was providing direct service, and I know how challenging it was. So, from one to the other, um, you know, congratulations on persevering and doing this important work. Um, I was hoping, you know, just again, as someone thinking about how to continue to fund my program, scale a program, meet community need, like there was this question about funding, but what, what is your, like, what keeps you up at night? What's the biggest issue you guys are concerned about right now? The second wave. <laughs> yes, the second wave. It's, um, it's, um, you, you know, we, so second wave, because uh, as public, as a community health center, our job is also to do uh, wellness and public health education. So to, to tell our patients, you know, everybody's got fatigue around this. You know, it's, it's very hard on every level, parents, families, people who are living by themselves. Um, um, yeah, and financially, I do get nervous that the state of New York is experiencing a, a, an unprecedented uh, deficit in terms of uh, funding and will they reduce funding to to health it, or or social services in general um you know the governor has said that he's thinking about you know 20 percent across the board reductions for every sector that's unprecedented really in our time so um and so yeah. you know to to add to what dan is saying i mean you know, we were lucky or, or skillful, however you want to put it, that we were not, we did not have to lay off any one of our employees except for our two dentists were furloughed for a couple of months. And that was because of the American Dental Association's restrictions on, on dental procedures. Uh, but as soon as we were, we were able to, we brought them right back. Uh, as Dan said, you know, the reductions that the governor is proposing, I don't know if we'll be as lucky next time if we'll be able to, you know, keep everybody working. Thank you. And thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Katie, you're up next. Then Dolores. Hey, uh, I'd like to first say what, or to uh, duplicate what Jessica said, but I think the fact that you guys have stayed open the entire time and not laid anybody off, except for the two dentists, given the dentistry rules, is phenomenal. 
Um, They're back. <laughs> very good. Um, but I do have a question, and I'm sorry if I missed it, or maybe I should know the answer already. But why is it that um, uh, that you're not able, that you're only doing the antigen testing right now, or the antibody testing, and not the COVID itself test? And I guess what I'm wondering is, for people in the community um, who think they may have COVID, where are you sending them if you can't do the testing there? Sure. Um, so there is a city testing site, which I have the address in my office, not, not in my bedroom. The um, Chelsea Center. <laughs> it's on 28th and 9th. Thanks, Will. Um, a part of it is, is that um, if we do testing, is that there's a lot of protocols around keeping the rooms. We don't have that many exam rooms. So once somebody comes in and we're doing a test on them, for COVID, then that room comes out of service for about three, two to three hours, roughly. So if we had like 10 people walk in, then essentially we would cease to function when we already have about 140 patients scheduled. So that's why we're not doing it. Plus it would burn through the PPE more than, and we're trying to conserve that in case there is a second wave. Um, and the city is being able to do that. The city is able to do that. So the city actually does a great program. So you go online, um, I don't have the link, uh, but if you go to nyc.gov and you can go and make an appointment in your neighborhood center and they have availability and you get the results within three hours. Um, it's a very, you know, you, they have an appointment. It's, it's like I said, it's totally free. And yeah, you go in. I mean, I, I actually went to get my test done on 28th and 9th and it took less than half an hour. Well, um, I was quick, in question, and out. quick question. You guys did do COVID testing before, right? On site? Very limited. Yeah, in the beginning, okay. limited. But, you know, there was, you know, we're actually still short on nasal pharyngeal swabs. And again, as Dan said, PPE, um, you know, we were, you know, had we done full scale or, or large scale testing, we actually closed one of our sites in Harlem, our Frederick Douglass site. And this actually, just because of the lack of volume, we transferred them over to our site a few blocks away, Thelma Dare. Um, the state actually used that site just for t as a testing site, um, and it was just closed, I think, in at the end of August. So, thank you. But the city Lawrence? does a great job for testing. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. No questions. You guys do a great job. Thank you for being part of our neighborhood and providing the services that you do. Martin. Martin definitely has a question. Martin. And then Nellie, if you have a question, you're welcome to ask. <laughs> Martin? Yeah. I had a food shot. If I come down with symptoms anyway, um, should I get tested? I have a flu shot and I come down with symptoms. Should I get tested? Right away. Yeah, so um, if I'm understanding correctly, is that some some people in reaction to the flu shot get like a little bit of a fever. Or yeah. A fever. So um, what the doctors have been telling people is, is that if you're in a high risk group, if you have, a, and I'm not a doctor, but this is my understanding, if you're in a high risk group or have some sort of conditions and think that there's like you haven't just been quarantined in your own in your own space and you might have been exposed is to try to get a test um if you're not in a high risk group they say and if you you know if you have a fever and it's not going up you know just wait a day or two and see if it goes away because if it goes away they say it's not likely COVID. but um if you're in a high risk group you should get tested right okay. and we have joe hector and jd Joe just joined. So, um, Hector and JD. Hello. Um, 
I just wanted to say, oh, still muted? No, I'm not. Okay. No, we no, are. I just wanted to say thank you very much for all the work uh, you folks do. Incredible work. Both my kids uh, went to PS11 and also attended the uh, clinic that you guys had um, many years ago. Um, and um, uh, I'm really amazed that you guys were able to carry out everything during these uh, epidemics and continue to stay open and serve the community the way you guys have. And continue the good work. I appreciate it. We all do. Okay? Thank you. That's all I wanted Thank to you. Jaden? Yeah, you guys do a terrific job for the community, the neighborhood. Your doctors are very dedicated. Just very dedicated. Please keep them. And I think Joe and I can remember when you first came into the neighborhood not that long ago. But you are a real positive, positive member of the community. So keep up the good work and thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I do see one public, uh, one attendee has their hand raised. Lucy. Nelly, um, if you could bring her over. Mm -hmm. Lucy, you can speak now. Lucy, can you hear us? Yes, hi. Hi, Lucy, did you have a question or a comment regarding the presentation that just um, happened? No. Oh, okay, your hand was raised, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Will, Dan, and Charlene for being here. Thank you for having us, and thank you for all the work that all of you do uh, on our behalf. Yes, thank you. Get your first oh, I will see you soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So next on the agenda, we have a committee discussion um, regarding homelessness. Uh, and while I know, Joe, you want to put the uh, letter up. So while we're, I guess, doing that. Um, You're going to have to put it up because I'm, I don't think I have it. I'm not on my computer. I'm on a tablet. Yeah, it's okay. Nellie's got it. But what I, I just wanted to share br briefly with everyone was um, just some of the things that we have done. Um, I, actually, it's in the letter, but I think I, I wanted to share anyway with committee because um, I'm not sure if they're clear about how much CB4 has been involved in meetings. Uh, myself, Joe, I don't remember, Dolores, if you've been in on any meetings, um, but uh, it's been a lot. Um, right now it's about 20. I think today I was on two of them. Um, so it, it's a lot talking with nonprofit provi providers in the community um, and listening to community concerns. Um, we've talked about staffing. We've talked about security at every site. We've talked about the services for clients, asked about the number of staffing. Um, and uh, it's been really challenging. Um, I think since May, I'm just giving a little quick recap. I think we've been discussing this at committee since May. It's come up every time on the agenda, um, which I think is significant. I, I, I have never seen that. I've only been on the board for six years, so it's not as long as other people, but um, I've never seen an item brought up at every committee, um, which is significant to me. And um, We've written, I think, Joe, this is our third letter or fourth letter? Fourth. Fourth, our fourth letter. And this one gets into the details. It's 11 pages, if not more. Um, we highlight the number of social services in uh, Community Board 4 um, and that have already existed. And then we add in the significant increase due to the relocation sites. Um, and we talk about what our main concerns are. Uh, what we would like to see happen. Um, the one thing that I do want to just add, um, because I today I was on a meeting with Skyline, and I have to say it was one of the most productive meetings I thought that I've been on in a long time. The other meeting that I can think of that I thought it was pretty, um, uh, not significant, that's not the word, but that it went well and um, the, the nonprofit provider was open to suggestions and also very uh, responsive was BBSJ on 57th Street. Right. Um, and 
is the letter up. That's about it that I wanted to share, really highlight for right now. Yeah, so, I, 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 I think the, the, the board has really gone over the top on engaging with this issue. Um, these meetings happened during the summer. They were pretty much just thrust upon us and Maria has carried a big part of that burden. But I also want to thank a lot of the committee members. This letter really was a product of a lot of back and forth among committee members. And if anything, it got better during the course of this letter. Um, this, this was published today at the committee board website. Nellie, can you go to the um, uh, map at the end? So I think this is significant. Um, the, we produced a map of all of our social services. Uh, pull it down a little bit, Nellie, so they can see what the types are first. No, down. Other, other direction. Right. So we list temporary homeless shelters, the relocations, homeless supportive housing, and homeless shelters and facilities. And if you pull it up now, Nellie, you can really see that our board is not a board that has said no to homeless facilities, whether they be temporary shelter or permanent housing. So the idea that these temporary relocations happen in a very unordered, unplanned way, and when you put it in perspective, the city noted that it relocated approximately 10,000 single adults in shelter and to our neighborhood now, originally we're 21,142, now there's 1,803. That is roughly 20% of the entire relocation it did in the city of New York. And that's why I believe we have our problems regarding this public safety issues because it was not planned, not thought out, and the building types that folks are relocated into for, for, for the providers and the shelter residents are just not adequate or properly programmed for that. And then on top of it, we've had an increase in street homeless and the combination of a great number of people with many social service problems have also attracted a great number of people dealing drugs. That's been a huge issue on, 30, on 36th Street, huge issue on 10th Avenue and on 42nd Street. So in total, we really have a not a social service issue only, but a resultant public safety crisis that is resultant from this poor planning. Um, I, I really encourage all the members of the committee and the members of the public, go to the community board website, this letter's now up there. Nelly, you can probably put the link in the um, chat so people can see it. And we just wanted to update where we are. This letter went out. We expect that we will be engaging with the Department of Homeless Services and the mayor's office sometime in the next two weeks. I believe we've taken a very thoughtful, considered position, but this administration hasn't exactly been the most thoughtful and considered in response. So given that, I would open up to the committee for any comments about next steps, and then we'll open up to the public for comments also. You want to, if you can take the map, yeah. So anyone can raise their hand. I'm kind of, Maria, if you can see everybody, call on, because I really can't see everybody at once on the tablet. You're, 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 you're muted. Thank you. Katie? Thanks. Um, so I am just curious what next steps are. And Maria and Joe, like I know you guys have done so much work and you've attended so many of these meetings. Are there going to be more meetings coming up? Do you want any of us to volunteer to help attend or cover? That would or? be great. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we're, um, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to start in October. I don't think it's scheduled yet. Monthly ab meeting, meaning the, the community advisory board meeting for all the shelters together. And Jesse's going to be running that. So having more than one of us on that would be excellent because the problem is there's so many hours in a day, Katie, right now. I'm sure. We're trying right. to manage. Yeah. But, we're, but our letter requested a meeting with the mayor and the commissioner. Steve Banks. So that's what we're looking to do to put together a working group to figure out how can we come up with a plan to manage, to reduce the population, increase the services and manage the public safety stuff. That's our, that's our big request. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, as good as mine about how they're going to respond. I believe we're getting clearer and clearer with the issue. Is. Um, I, I just wanted to add to that. Uh, there was a meeting I was on recently with I believe it was uh, on 36th Street. And I know that they're going to be using, be able to use like Met Met Metro Baptist space um, starting this month for some programming. Um, I, I don't know how often that's going to be 
uh, it sounded like it was a pilot. Um, and what I heard on the meeting also, I mean, was um, adding additional security um, at some point at this, uh, during this month. Um, I mean, there's things at every site that's being talked about. It's just really hard to there is no overall plan. That's our problem. Yeah, there's nothing consistent and across like the chipping board. Chipping here, chipping there, a little yeah. bit. A pilot you, program, Metro Baptist, is not going to serve 1,803 right. people. Just not going to okay. do it in multiple that's, locations. And something that we also mentioned in one of our letters is DHS also having like protocols in place for, um, which would be great for all the sites, something consistent and across the board. Like for example, having the QR codes, which are for oversight to ensure that um, people are uh, going to the location that they're supposed to when they're doing, um, let's say security checks. Um, so, if they're it actually is, doing rounds. So, 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 so yeah, they, when they're doing they, rounds. They're doing code when they're doing the rounds as opposed to saying they are and really just not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And JD is raising his hand. Yes. Uh, the skyline uh, up on 10th Avenue between 49th and 50th, uh, the situation has improved uh, greatly. Uh, I, so the question is, why has it improved? And can that Whatever work there, can that be taken to other problematic shelters, Here's, like on 6th Street? Um, great question, JD. Something that, um, actually Joe has discussed it and talked about it before openly in meetings, and I think it's very true. And we all know this kind of common sense kind of thing is that you as a nonprofit provider, you bring a certain kind of culture. You have a culture that exists at your facility, right? And certain things are considered acceptable, some things are not, um, and it's just how you are managing um, your staff and managing your clients. And so, for example, with the skyline, um, what someone actually shared in a meeting today was that they were actually telling their clients they can no longer hang out in front of the skyline. Their clients, and she, she actually shared that clients have been upset about that. So that's something significant. I think it's just about having a level of like what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And I'm sorry, guys, I'm sorry, you need to come in or you need to keep moving, you can't hang out. And I think you can do that and also have compassion and empathy, right? But it's also about what is going to be um, tolerated and accepted, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I really believe it, it is not surprising that black veterans of social justice does not have a major problem at the Watson on 57th Street, yet we have a huge problem with NICA. This is a organizational culture, organizational management. Some have been able to manage better, others not, and therefore our community is suffering, and the funding agency, DHS, must hold those providers accountable. That's just basic how you work social services in this. If you're, if you're getting funded, you have to provide it, and you have to provide it in a responsible way and if you have security issues, you have to raise it. So it is, our, it is our job to keep people's feet to the fire. And I think really sitting down with the mayor's office and DHS and coming up with a plan as to how we're going to manage this, that's the key here. And Katie, yeah. I don't have the steps because they, they haven't really talked to us yet. That's the problem. So my, and my, my question, I'm sorry, just to follow up. My question then is, uh, is there a deadline for them responding? Um, what, what, oh, and if they don't respond, then what? Well, what do we normally do, JD? Well, we, we, we keep at it, we keep at it. But yeah. I think sometimes it's good to have a deadline to say, if we don't hear back in two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is, and the situation is still out of hand, uh, then we need to hit, hit again. Well, we, we, we actually did ask them for a meeting. If they don't respond by the end of this month, they're going to get a very bigger broadside next month from us, and it's going to be very public. Right. Well, one thing that was supposed to happen that I think would, would be helpful, actually, but still hasn't, and there's no date for it. Oh, I think you mentioned it already, Joe. We're supposed to have like a district-wide cab, and we haven't heard about a date about that yet. Um, we announced our September meeting to happen in October. It's October 15th, guys. Like, yeah. 
Uh, Betty had her hand up. I saw her hand up. Yeah, Betty. First, you guys are doing a great job. It is amazing. And the letter was in a monumental document. Um, I hadn't seen this, the uh, map before tonight. And, you know, I love the map. Um, and I, I also had two other thoughts in dealing with the mayor's office and DHS to uh, make the point when you said that 20% uh, if I got it right, of the um, temporary shelter hotels are in uh, District 4, is 20%, that- 20% of the 10,000 single people relocated. It relocated in a city or the borough or- In a city. In a city, okay. So I, I would think it would be nifty if you could make some kind of bar chart or pie chart or something that just shows that, uh, you know, it, it, to just put it out there. I think it's a dramatic statistic. So that's one thing. And the other thing is for those facilities that are doing it right, you might make something very simple in terms of what factors make them succeed. And so it's sort of almost like a no brainer for, for other facilities. Um, that was my, my two ideas and, and you just keep, keep going. Thanks. Thanks, Betty. Uh, Dolores, I'm sorry I went over you. Um, I passed you, you had your hands up, your virtual okay. hand. Everybody's comment is valid. Um, Joe, you asked the question, what do we normally do? What we normally do is we partner with our elected officials. I've been on record saying this and I'll continue saying this. We have a complete political vacuum. We're not being supported by the people that can make the changes happen. Everyone on this committee, everyone on this board has been doing everything in our power. We've written letters. You guys have gone to endless meetings. There have been walkthroughs. There have been proposals uh, for community members to do actual their own cleanup on their streets for, um, I mean, uh, I can't remember, Sliwa was at our, our, our um, full board meeting. The guardian angels, they're coming back to our neighborhood. I mean, I remember them as a kid throughout the neighborhood. Everybody on our side is doing what we need to do. We do not have political support. So there are plenty of ideas, not just from us, but from other members of the community that have been coming up over the last few months. And they're great ideas. And a lot of them are implementable. The problem is, we don't have political support. And we're not going to accomplish reducing that density or pressuring any of these facilities to go ahead and provide the services needed to ensure the safety of those residents and the safety of our other residents unless we have political support. That's as simple as that. And uh, let me just chime in. We have some political support, but not all of our elected officials who cover this district. Um, are supporting this cause, uh, which I agree with you, Dolores, is, um, is part of the main issue. Um, is, does anyone else want to? Oh, JD, and then Leslie. Just to follow up on that, can, can we request a sit down meeting? That is, we, Lowell, the community board, with Maria and Joe and Lowell, to sit down with Corey or Brad and, and talk about this. Is that out of out of the question? I, I would just say we should, should have a sit down meeting with everyone together. Period. Yeah. I'm not going to single out anybody. There are some people who are more vocal than others. Let's put everybody in the same room and talk this through. Yeah, yeah. In the yeah. same Zoom room. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I want to highlight, JD, is that when when I was talking about the 20 meetings, almost 20 meetings, or I think it's maybe but today 20. Today makes it 20, I think. Um, the speaker is usually present. Um, so, speaker I mean, I, yeah, the speaker's the speaker. office is usually present. I think. Priya, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what Joe just said is important. 
The speaker's office is at all of these meetings. The speaker's office is being very proactive. They're on the streets walking with you. They're in all these meetings. They are doing the work. Corey Johnson is absent. Corey Johnson has it in his power to assist in the density issue, to assist in working with DHS on these facilities, providing the services needed for the public safety of those residents and the other residents within the community. So Corey's office right. is there. Corey is not. And that's what I'm calling out. Political vacuum completely. He is the speaker. He should be actually doing the work. Joe, so, you were going to say something? Yeah. yeah. I just think that we're starting to get some ideas here at, at the next letter coming out of this committee for this month. And that is we're asking for a meeting of all the elected officials with the board to really sit and respond to us on the letter that we sent. We're also, uh, as, as Betty noted, um, I'm sorry, Betty, I'm forgetting what you said. It was perfect. Having a COVID moment. Uh, th there were two things. Right. A, and a, a chart showing the 20% of the city, which is an amazing statistic. And yeah. also maybe the, the like the 10 qualities that make for a successful yeah. facility right. or something. Right. So, I think, so I think that is our follow-up letter saying now that we've asked for this meeting with the mayor's office and, and, and the administration, also a meeting with our elected officials to, to deal with this. Because we have to keep the pressure up to get people to engage. I do believe in the end, everybody will engage here. I do believe it's just, gonna, it's just taking way too long and there's way too many problems happening that are not being solved. It's not going to help right. us just get a little more security if it's, if it's a disaster. Leslie? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's also a bottom line issue. Somebody is making money out of poverty and that a needs lot. to be addressed. Jessica? Yeah, just to underscore the, um, the point about moving quickly, I'm sure I mean, you guys are a lot, 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 lot closer to this, probably too close for your, your, your preference. Um, but the press, you know, like the Lucerne topic is like, I'm hearing it every freaking day on the radio. You hear lower Manhattan residents talking about how they don't want these places moved there. You hear advocates talking about how, you know, these individuals should not be moved multiple times. They are all valid and important points. But I think Dolores, um, her point is, 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 is right on a few different levels, including like, we, we really need leadership to come up with a plan quickly and execute that plan with, you know, a high degree of confidence that this is the right plan. Otherwise, this, this is going to just going to continue to be feed, it's going to be fed by people's concerns and ongoing community debate, which obviously we're all for, we're doing it here right now. Um, but I, I just, I'm really concerned that it's gonna be almost feel impossible to find a solution that keeps everyone happy. Um, and that the more that the media focuses on this, the more we're stuck with this problem. Right, and also from, from the point of view is we're not talking about a day now. This is a very good possibility. A lot of these temporary shelters will be in place through next summer, through next yeah. spring. And I don't yeah. think not any of us can bear to live in this manner People on 36th Street, now on 10th Avenue it's a little bit better, but who knows, as we, we have to get some standard practice on how things are managed. Otherwise, yeah. we're gonna go down into a black hole again. Wait, um, JD, before you speak again, let me just check in on Hector and Martin to see if they have anything they wanna add. Hector? Yeah, actually I do. Um, I, I agree with Dolores. And, um, about Corey Johnson's office. I, I do appreciate that Eric and Carl and some of the other individuals that work for Corey Johnson's office is uh, representing, you know, representing him in some and most of these meetings, but Corey Johnson himself hasn't been present, but it can't all fall, you know, at his feet, obviously. I mean, the, the buck stops, stops pretty much at the mayor, okay? And, and let's face it, um, the way he's been running this, these programs, the way he's been implementing uh, this emergency hotel uh, shelter locations has been really pitiful, um, really, really bad leadership on, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure 
there's probably a bunch of people in agreement with that as well. Um, so it, it doesn't just stop at Corey's office. It, it's actually, you know, it's, uh, the mayor's fault as well. Um, if not, it's, it's the mayor, mayor first and foremost, because they run the agencies. So exactly, exactly. And, and it's not only that, uh, DHS, I mean, we could, we can basically say uh, they failed in a lot of the tasks that they're, they're supposed to be responsible for, but honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's a whole factor of things, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, DHS, not, you know, following the mandates of the mayor, obviously, and trying to implement his policies uh, has failed in, in a lot of regards. I, I know they're struggling. There's some good people in DHS that we've dealt with. Um, but honestly, it's time for some really good leadership here. I mean, uh, if, if the people in DHS or, uh, you know, can't get the job done, maybe we should try to find somebody else who will, uh, you know, let's vote them out. It's a voting year. Let's, let's change things up. Um, it's not a voting year for some reason, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, Danny, anything to you want to go to the public? Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, JD. Thank you, Hector. Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, I think I'm meeting with the uh, electors. If we can do it, it's a very good idea. And also, I think we can be very specific. We're not going to solve the whole homeless problem throughout the city, but we can certainly be very specific about 36th Street. That is something that needs to be solved. Those people are frightened. And that's something we can focus on. We don't have to say solve the whole issue, but we can focus specifically. And as Maria uh, pointed out, some, uh, and Joe pointed out, some operators are good and we can focus on the ones that are not good. And I think we could probably get some results. Agreed. Uh, Martin? Oh, I'm um, I just to from the public, are there members of the public, uh, especially 36th Street yes. here? Yes, we're going to bring them in. Gonna... We have a lot of members waiting, so that's why I want to continue. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh. Katie? Um, I think this is similar to what, uh, or follows on to what JD just suggested as well. I, to be honest with you, I feel like we've had a lot of meetings. I think we are, we are super clear on what the concerns are. And as JD said, you know, around 36th and 37th Street. And while I, I certainly appreciate it's a good idea to ask for a letter, I actually think that it would be lovely and faster if we said, um, wrote like a one paragraph thing that said, you know, dear Corey Johnson, dear mayor, we want you to sign this saying that you support a request to de-densify the 36th street um, area. We want at least one of those places shut down in the next month and fine by us. Again, we support it. Fine by us if you put it somewhere else in our district, but it cannot be, um, you know, uh, so dense. And I think if we just make a very specific proposal and ask them to sign on to it, as opposed to like, come talk to us some more, because I, I, we've done the work. We know what needs to be done. We have a solution and we need them to support it. Well, I would say just getting them in the room alone is the first goal because no one's gonna sign anything because they believe, unfortunately DHS believes they're doing the perfect job right now. They acknowledge there are some issues but it, they're very invested. So just getting them at the table, I believe, Katie, is our first step. Joe, I think it's also important to point out that um, those specific elected officials chose not to sign on to Gail Brewer's letter. So they're avoiding dealing with 36th Street. It's unfortunate. And I just wanted to just say, Hector, I'm not blaming Corey for the, for the situation. I'm, I'm blaming him for the lack of leadership because in the end, he is our council member and our council member should be fighting for every single resident. And that's not just residents that have been here pre-COVID, uh, pre but the residents that are also here now. So those shelter residents aren't being fought for. Um, they're not getting those services. And those that live on the block certainly aren't being fought for. 
uh, in terms of having to deal with a very rapid change in, in their community, which has become a public safety issue. So can we now go to the public and Nellie, can you see that um, Maria, the hands up and start bringing people in one at a time? Yeah, and Nellie, can you see her? Or I don't know if you would just unmute them or bring them over, I'm not sure what you do. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, okay, thank you. I cannot tell you what it is like to listen to this meeting and realize how profoundly you understand the issue that we're facing on 36th Street. And I thank each and every one of you. You are everything that we hope for in a democracy. God bless you. I am gonna give you two, two new thoughts that I had, because I think about this every day. I just Googled the population of the Upper West Side today. There are 100,706 residents today and the Upper West Side. To have a sense of what we're dealing with down here on 36th Street, a shelter population on our block, twice the size of the number of residents, imagine 202,000 shelter residents arriving over a 24 hour period to live five months without services on the Upper West Side. Three hotels were put on the Upper West Side, not 202,000 residents. And, and I feel strongly that because they have not been provided with any services, they can't because there's no room in the hotels. The only services that they've been provided with are the drug guys who come and service them in the morning and in the afternoon. At four o'clock, the shelter at the Doubletree, the uh, homeless services pulls up in their van briefly. And I want to go out and say, why aren't, why aren't you here 12 hours before when we have 40 guys standing doing chin-ups under the block? Um, they are increasingly angry and increasingly, they haven't been treated. Uh, and so it's gotten, it's very different now than it was in June because they're desperate. And that's why we see people assaulted. That's why people, you know, you've heard of, you know more than we do, I think about our block at this point, but it's, it's getting worse for them because even we're getting worse because we're not seeing any relief, but they're getting worse because they're not getting any mental health help. They're not getting any drug help. They're not getting any counseling because there's no room in the, there's only room in the lobby for one weapons detector. They can't even feed them in the lobby here. So nobody even went into the buildings to check them out before they put people here. So that's why, you know, the little family, a lady in a sari, two, you know, Indian family, two kids, elementary kids, husband, she's knocked to the ground. You know, the one thing that you see all over, badly hurt, the police came and they said, we can't arrest anybody. Can't arrest the gentleman because he's a mentally ill person and he's back on the block, you know. So I think it's getting worse because they haven't been provided with any services. And, yeah. uh, and I think the density thing, imagine 200,000 people being put on the Upper West Side. Uh, I mean, they're making a fuss over three hotels. Well, yes. I think Thank we can remember too that if there were less people in each hotel, there would be more space to help people and provide some kind of services. Absolutely. It doesn't mean every single room needs to be used to house somebody. We need to have a plan. That's the guts. Thank you, Ann. Thank Who's you, next? Ann. Brian Weber. And I actually would encourage um, anyone who is on the attendee list who lives on 36 or 37 to speak because um, we need to hear your voice. Hello. Hi, Hi guys. Brian. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah. it's Brian Weber. Uh, I've spoken to many of you. Uh, Maria must be tired of hearing from me at this point. Joe, too. Um, I am a resident on 36th Street. I have a front row view of the Doubletree Hotel. I'm also a public member of Community Board 4, and um, I'm uh, a co-chair of the uh, recently formed uh, 36th Street Block Association, which, which formed as a result of what's occurring on our street now. Um, at this point, we're five months into this, uh, since the arrival of uh, both NICA and Black veterans at um, the Doubletree and the Marriott. 
Um, and I don't know how many speakers will be on tonight. I don't know what the community board continues to hear from the public, but I'm, I'm gauging it's a lot. But I gotta say, so much of what's going on on our street constantly in a 24 seven hour period is not reported. We just don't know who to even share this information with. Uh, at the start of this, I was telling my neighbors, you gotta call Corey's office, they're gonna help us, you gotta call Community Board 4, and, and I, again, thank you guys for, for listening and hearing us and uh, showing compassion to our situation. But just last night, in a two hour period, uh, we had 11 emergency response vehicles, um, police, fire, ambulance, uh, reporting to different incidences occurring both at NICA and Black veterans. And they're directly across the street from one another. Um, I, I just wanna say that um, on 36th Street, I know it's a different situation than the rest of Hell's Kitchen, uh, increased security, increased sanitation and recreational space alone is not going to cut it. We must reduce uh, the density of the shelter population. And I really think we must uh, relocate one of the shelters and I'd, I'd advocate for NICA. There was discussion earlier about shelter culture and I could tell you from what I witnessed uh, that NICA's operational protocols uh, are lacking. Um, their staff is unmasked, their staff is unruly, they cannot maintain curfew. Uh, I could go on and on. I can go on and on about them double parking in the street, making it difficult for emergency responsors to get onto our block and park in front of the hotel. But I, I know my time is limited. And I, I really wanna echo what Dolores said. I wasn't gonna specifically do so, but since she's already called them out, I wanna say that uh, we need Corey Johnson and Brad Hoyleman to get on board with the concept of reducing the density of the shelter population. Corey's office routinely responds to my neighbors by saying, we've added security, we've added sanitation. This is not addressing the situation. Um, we have to have some hard discussions, which I see that the community board is willing to do. And um, I, I wanna let my other uh, fellow neighbors speak, but I would just ask that when those conversations do occur, um, that A, the community board is in the room as I'm sure they would be. And I'd also just like to request that someone from 36th Street be in the room to give the perspective of what it's like as a resident to, uh, to be living on this block uh, during current times. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, do you think, uh, you can't see how many people are raising their hand, right Joe? I'm just wondering if I need to start timing people. What I'm gonna ask, I appreciate everyone who's raising their hand. If you it's about 12 right now, Maria. Okay. If you could keep your comments a little bit brief, um, I'd appreciate it. I just think it's important that we have as many people speak as possible. Uh, the next person is Alexander. You could unmute that person or bring them over. Are they already here? Alexander? Hi, can you hear me? We hear you. Great, thank you. I, I, I will be brief because the, thank it, it, Thank you. I, I do appreciate everyone's time and I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, as I said, I'll try to be as brief as possible. And really, n not because I don't have as much to say, but because uh, echoing Brian's sentiments, especially Brian and I have never met. However, we've been on many of these calls together and I, I, I've, uh, uh, my wife and I have had the opportunity to, to speak and, and be involved. And I, I really, I, my wife and I are residents of 36 between 7th and 8th. We are the only residential uh, on 36 between 7th and 8th. Uh, so we have a, 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 a rather unique perspective as well. And it, it really, without going uh, too much further, it really is an untenable situation. It, it, is, it is everything that everyone has, has said already. Um, uh, Ms. Rubin, uh, Ms. Rubin, you, you, uh, hit the nail on the head. So much of the so much of the issue is about the lack of services as well as the lack of uh, a lack of political will. But it also is that the police department. My wife and I have seen people arrested and literally back on the street three hours later. Not even uh, like like nothing happened. 
and the cops, they come around, they, they hang out in front of our building and we talk with them and we get their perspective as well. The density, the density is, is a, is a, is such a, is such a, a factor. It should not be overlooked uh, in, in comparison to uh, these other issues. And it is, and, and I know that there's other residents of, of my building on this, on this call right now. And they will probably, I uh, assume will, will echo similar sentiments. Uh, our children are unable to, my, my son used to walk to 38th and 8th for a slice of pizza. I, I, I can't let him do that anymore. He and my daughter used to ride their scooters around the blocks. Can't let them do that anymore. These, these it, it, as I said, it's an untenable situation. I do appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share uh, my, you know, on, on behalf of my wife and I, uh, and, and I would be happy to continue this conversation with whomever in whatever venue uh, is afforded to me. Thank you. Thank you. David, you are up next. Can you hear us, David? Yeah, I just had to unmute, sorry. Okay, great. Wow, this is my first exposure to your committee. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for your calm and thoughtful approach to this really, really difficult topic. Um, could you post a link to the letter, Joe, that you've mentioned? Because I looked on the website and I don't see it quickly. Um, it yeah. looks great. Yes, I'm going to ask Nellie from our district office to do that. Great, thank you. Um, I'm a member of the 29th Street Neighborhood Association, and I'm curious what we can do to help and support you and back you up on this. Um, we think that we cover this 23rd to 34th River to River, although there's you know sort of five volunteers, so. We can't possibly do what you guys can accomplish, but I'm curious how we can support you. And then my, my other question is, do you coordinate with your counterparts at CB5? Is there a way that together we can help you? Because CB5 has not the acuity that you see on 36th Street, but the number of hotels that are being used for this purpose in CB5 in the 20s and 30s is, is a concern for me. And I wonder if there's somehow power in aligning with them to catch up to where you are to put more pressure on Corey. So uh, first, uh, please send your contact information to um, uh, actually put it in the chat so then Nelly can pick it up, okay, okay. And, and reach out to you. The second thing is, yes, we do normally coordinate with CB5, but I will tell you that this has been coming so fast and furious. Sure. We've been sort of just trying to ride the wave ourselves. We will reach out to CB5, and I know that Jesse Bodine, our district manager, has spoken to CB5, to Wally, the district manager, but coordinating in a better way would be, makes a lot of sense. I think that that's a very good idea. Okay, and I'm happy to help with that. You may, Wally um, either retired or disappeared. They've got a brand new person there. I think everyone's you know, doing what you're doing, trying to keep up with a rapidly changing situation. So if I can help be a bridge between you and them, I'm happy to do that too. We would very much appreciate that. Okay, Thank you. great. Thank you, David. Um, we're going to bring over Bernard, and I'm going to ask everyone to keep their comments to two minutes. The other thing I should add is uh, there are also things that I haven't shared because there's just so much information, including with you, Joe, even though we speak, but there's just so much it's uh, overwhelming. But I have actually been in contact with someone um, from CB5 uh, who co-chairs the similar committee, so we, can, we should talk about that. Um, Bernard? Hi, yeah. yeah, hi, this is Bernard. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, just want to reiterate what uh, uh, the previous speakers have said about, you know, their appreciation for the board, uh, you know, really appreciate it. And I, I know you guys are getting strung along. Uh, and, you know, that that sort of leaves me sort of despondent, but I really appreciate you, you know, staying at them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just hard to describe like the, the temerity that you have leaving your building around here. Um, you know, we have this sort of weird curfew that's not COVID related. And, uh, you know, I'm about to go out now and get myself a slice. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it's like, you feel like, yeah, you're in a, a weird sort of quarantine where you should be stockpiling. So uh, I think Katie really had it uh, correct in terms of, you know, uh, you know, not to be selfish about this, but, you know, we know where the problem is. And, you know, and we're, you know, uh, Brian, myself, we're down here. Alex, we're I can't even imagine being um, east of, of 8th Avenue. I mean, I, my, like, my heart goes out to him. It's like, to me, that's like a no-go zone. So, uh, 
I really appreciate it. And that's it. What, what Katie said about, you know, telling, being specific, we're not going to solve homelessness, but, you know, putting however many thousand people on one street or two streets is insane. And uh, if you could just, you know, also even, you know, further, the more you can further, uh, you know, further it to the, the, the double tree or the former double tree on the north side of 36. That's all. Thanks. Uh, Bernard, just want to know, Thank you. don't get despondent. Water eventually goes through rock. And our community board, our members can attest, we do not give up on issues. We just keep on pushing. Yeah, yes, we, we really appreciate it because we're down here, guys. We appreciate everything <laughs> you're doing here. We're down here. Thank you for speaking, Bernard. Lucy, you're up next. You have two minutes. Lucy, can you hear us? Yep. Hi, guys. Um, it is awesome to hear that that tenacity. Like we 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 need we need you to 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 keep at it. Um, you know, I'm a res resident of 36th Street. I'm between 8th and 9th. I look out at the Double Tree all day, um, and I just wanted to tell you a little tiny story of the typical thing that we'll see out here. Um, this was a couple weeks ago, we saw a duo from the Doubletree, uh, one in a wheeled walker, go over to the entrance of 360 West 36th Street, which is just two doors down from us. The one guy took the other guy's shoes off, shot him up in the feet, mm. he nodded out. We called 911 because that's what all the officials have said. That's what everybody said. Call 911 if you see somebody doing or dealing drugs. Um, eight and a half minutes later, a fire department truck showed up. Four guys got out, shook the guy to see if he was conscious. An ambulance showed up. Two people got out, shook the guy to see if he was conscious. He reacted a little bit. The people in the fire truck got back in the truck and left. And then the ambulance guys got back in their ambulance and left. This guy then sat for an hour and a half, sprawled out on the sidewalk. And then his buddy yelling at him to get up, get up, get up, get back to the double tree. He finally like- 25 seconds. He got up, he literally wheeled himself slowly back across the street to get back into the double tree. This is not a managed shelter these people cannot be sustained 10 seconds and we cannot continue to live in this environment thanks keep at it stay strong you cannot and you don't deserve to peter you're next hi can you hear me um yes we hear you okay so my name is Peter Orland. I'm married to Doris Oust. We live between um, 7th and 8th on 36th Street. And um, we feel pretty bad for a lot of these, the people that we see on the street. I mean, it's a, it's a really horrible situation for them. I really appreciate that the board has mixing the right amount of compassion as well as uh, concern for the residents who are already here. I just wanted to say in light of uh, Ms. Rubin's comments that Corey Johnson's been completely unresponsive. Um, is there maybe the only way really to, to get their attention is to contact the media. Brian Lair has the mayor on at 11 o'clock on WNYC. Um, the, the reason why I'm saying yeah. this is that very often you don't really, um, you don't, you don't really get much attention from public officials unless they feel there's public pressure on them. So I know New York won and, um, Gothamist have had some information on what's going on around here, but there's far less um, buzz in the media concerning our neighborhood than there has been for the Upper West Side, which is, has, um, as everybody has remarked, is a much less serious situation. So I mean, so I mentioned the mayor is on Brian Lair on Fridays at 11, typically. I don't know if he'll be on tomorrow, but um, if that's one avenue you can try. Uh, 30 seconds, Peter. Okay. And that's all I'm asking. And uh, thanks for the good work. Thank you. Val? Hello, you hear me? Hi, Val. Yeah, we hear you. Two seconds. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Val. Um, I live between 8 and 9 on 36th. 
I have a nine-year-old son and I'm a single mom. Uh, just wanted to say thank you, first of all, for helping us, trying to help us. Uh, I actually live in that building that Lucy was describing with the two men without shoes. And I had guests that day and they saw the whole incident. And I did see how ambulance came, nobody helped them and they just left. And those two guys stayed near my building. I have pictures of it. I mean, I took, I took some pictures from the lobby. I mean, every day I see something disturbing. At 10 a.m. I saw a heroin addict inject himself in the open. Uh, I took a picture of that. Uh, my son sees from the window heroin addicts passed out right in front of our window because it faces 36th Street. Uh, I'm scared to go out and unfortunately it's not a choice for me. I have to go to work and I have to take my son to school. Uh, when I walk, I'm scared to death that someone who is high or mentally ill was just punch me or my son on Thursday um, while he was doing his uh, blended learning we heard somebody was robbed and a woman screaming that somebody robbed her uh, I mean I'm scared to death walking on 36th street I'm trying to avoid it but sometimes I just can't avoid it and I walk there I'm just scared that somebody who is high just gonna uh, punch me. So I just go on the street with the cars. You have 25 seconds now. Thank you. And I mean, I can't sleep at night since ambulances and fire trucks are always on our street in the middle of the night. I don't, I don't remember a night where I didn't wake up in the middle of the night because somebody is crazy screaming or an ambulance is coming. I mean, like what criminal act has to happen on here so someone will start acting and moving them from this street. Like, I feel unheard. Right. Like, when is this gonna Thank happen? Thank you, Val. Thank you. Carol? Carol, can you hear us? Hi, uh, yes, Hi, I'm sorry, just yes. I got it. I have a timer on Maria, so don't worry. Um, thank you all. I'm, I echo everything everybody said. Um, particularly Val just now and Bernard earlier describes what it's like on the block. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, I'm, I'm a uh, former prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office. I spent the first 15 years of my career there, so I'm, I'm used to um, crime and things like that. I've never, and I don't scare easily, um, I do not like leaving my apartment um, when it's dark. Um, it's, I can't get to your front door because people are like huddled around it doing things uh, that you, they shouldn't be doing. Uh, and it's, it's not safe. I don't have children. I can't imagine what the other neighbors in my building feel like. Um, uh, one of the things I would like to add, I think Betty had a great point about the bar chart. If you could, um, in highlighting the neighborhood, if you could highlight 36th Street in particular, because we have over 500 people between 8th and 9th Avenue, that will make it much clearer. I absolutely love that idea, but I think that would take it to, to a, um, a different level. Um, and just, you know, finally, in speaking with, with the elected officials, I agree with everything. We're not really getting the represent representation that we need. But also, in speaking with the mayor, you know, the police take their, um, take their direction from the mayor's office. So we could get more support. And the Midtown South Precinct is on 35th Street. Their driveway comes out onto 36th Street on this block. And they are not getting the direction or the support from the mayor to actually be able to to, from a safety perspective, help the people on this block. Um, so in conversations with them, and if you need anybody from the 315 West 36th Street uh, board to come and join any, any conversations, I am happy to volunteer. Thank you all so much. You've done a fantastic job. I'm so impressed with you. Thanks. Thank you so Thank you. much, Carol. Andrew? Uh, hello, yes, um, and I, I'd like to uh, back up totally what everyone is saying about the hard work that the community board is doing. It's really, really appreciated, and thank heavens someone is uh, speaking up. Uh, I, I live also in the same building as Val, uh, 36th, between 8th and 9th, and uh, we have a, and someone earlier on um, quite rightly made the point about how this was like a sort of, in a way, like an extra COVID quarantine, um, but it's not our related. I mean, we have a, uh, a child, our, our, our son is under the age of two, and, and the reality is, is that we have to be fairly careful any time of day that we go out with him, and that does not seem to me to be in any way appropriate. And I think I would uh, very much back up what uh, Brian has said, is yes, of course, uh, these folks uh, should get more support and more help 
uh, and it is clearly not happening, and that's clearly contributing to the problem. Um, but I would say the underlying problem is clearly density, and that, that's really what has to be addressed uh, head on. So, uh, but thank you very much all, uh, very much appreciated for all the hard work you're doing. Thank you, Andrew. Marta? Can you hear us? Marta, can you hear us? I can. Good okay, evening. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you now. Thanks. Okay, Two thank minutes. You. Um, I'm also on West 36th Street between 7 and 8, uh, like Peter. I want to follow on from what Peter said and also what Jessica said, uh, Jessica from the committee, about media. Uh, the media situation is very important and it's important that we have a very clear, thought out, well thought, well thought out and delicate strategy. Uh, Peter mentioned compassion, and I think we all do. We are not the Upper West Side um, who had a media strategy that backfired on them. But as Jessica pointed out, that hasn't gone away, and it's getting in, and it's getting in the way of our, our, us getting our message across. But having no strategy is not a strategy. If I can help at all in any way um, in it, with it, I'm, I'm a former journalist, I have a lot of media contacts, and, and, and if I can be involved in brainstorming how we handle it, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. That'd be, that'd be very helpful. And again, your contact information sent to Nelly so we can, we can be able to follow up with you. Okay. Yes, please, thank you. Um, Katie, I think that's how you say your name. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it. Can you hear us? Yes, hi. Um, my name is actually Kath, and I live in the Kath. same building as Val and Andrew. And um, we are under a constant assault. It's not just an assault when we go out on the street. We're assaulted in our apartments. I work from home, and I have a lot of meetings. And all during the day, the sirens, the police, the whatever, I, I can't even talk on the phone half the time. That's kind of pathetic that even in my own home and something as simple as there's a group of guys outside the double tree who play their music constantly constantly and it's loud and it like it's like it's in my apartment i call 311 so often okay that's not someone shooting up and i've seen that a number of times but it's such a mental assault that i just i'm constantly stressed because there's nowhere to go. I can't, like, my home is no longer a sanctuary that a home should be. That's not how we should live. And I have to say thank you so much for your support because without you guys, I don't know where we'd be because clearly Corey Johnson is MIA and that's so disappointing. But the other thing I'd like to say is the thing that I do not understand is we know where the drug dealers are. They stand out at 36th and 8th they're there every day. I can point them out. They have tried to sell me drugs. Why can't the police do something? Why, and where are all these security guys? That's what I'd like to know. Why can't a security person be permanently stationed on that corner? Of course- 25 if, seconds, Kat. Like, yeah, the issue is there's too many people. Um, and so these little fixes here and there, it's not the solution, but at least it would be um, it would make 36th Street safer to walk down. Like, I don't even walk down 36th anymore. And, I'm, and I know most of the people that are talking don't either. Thank you so much again, and that's it. Thank you. And Ms. M. Krebs? Hi, can you hear us? This is Marlise, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Hi, uh, I live on 36th Street between 8th and 9th as well, and I just wanted to say ditto. Thank you all so much. I had no idea we had such robust advocates in our corner, so it's good to know. I have three kids, and they're all trying to deal with getting back into some semblance of school and all the anxiety that goes along with that, and they have to hear, as other people have mentioned the other day, a woman screaming, blood curdling scream for help. Um, every time we leave, we have to go as a group. My kids were just starting to go out on their own. 
as someone else mentioned in the neighborhood and that is no longer possible. They are not leaving our, our house without an escort. And even at that, we still have to plan and try to see how we're going to circumnavigate the safest routes from the corner to our building and back, which is not possible to do at this point. It's gotten much worse. Um, we have to walk through or around groups of people without masks, plumes of marijuana, cigarette smoke, people urinating on the walls and the cars, or in a state of delirium or anger. Um, and of course, my children have now seen people shooting up on the corners. It's, it's really devastating. So um, this is every time we leave. I, when I go out by myself, I can no longer go out at night because it's, I'm accosted every time I leave, every time I come back, even if I'm on my own. So we can no longer do that. We have to go out as a family. 30 seconds. So that's all I have to say. Just let us know what else we can do to help because we're willing. Thank you. Thank you. Alexandra? Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I want to um, go off a little on a slightly tangent of this. I know that um, I know that there's a lot of issues and everybody's venting over all the things that they've experienced, but I keep hearing people say, we're not gonna hold, solve homelessness. And I know that we have a problem that we need to deal with and that needs to be addressed, but we're just kicking down the bucket. We just keep fighting the symptoms and we're not, having, we're not dealing with the fact that homelessness in the city is increasing, has been increasing for years, and it's going to increase even more after the pandemic. Whether we want it or not, the fact is that we're gonna have a lot of evictions um, because no one's doing anything to, at, at this point, no one's doing anything to, to, to try to address that. And there's only, not just the evictions piece, but there's also the lack of affordable housing. Uh, someone asked in the last meeting uh, what was being done in our district to see if there were any new initiatives to increase for zoning uh, or for increasing the number of affordable housing units in our district. And by affordable housing, I mean something at a, at a, at a low percentage of average median income, not the, the farce that has been done in a lot of the, 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 the buildings in our area that are targeting the like 150% of API. I mean, really much lower uh, average median income percentages. Uh, and you yeah. guys just picked 30 the, seconds, picked Alexandra. Down the You said it was going to be uh, discussed in a different meeting. And, but I think that needs to be discussed uh, sooner rather than later, because we're going to have even more people going into homelessness. I lost my job during the pandemic. I was unemployed for three months. And luckily, I have a job now. But the reality is a lot of people lost their job and still don't have a job. And they're gonna end up in the homeless system as well. Thank you, Alexandra. So I, I just wanna note for everybody, the majority of affordable housing produced in our district is for uh, people, is for 60% of AMI to 50% of AMI, meaning a family of four making less than like 55,000, a single person less than 42,000. So that's the majority of housing being built. We do not have a majority of housing being built for anyone at 120, 150% of AMI, which is moderate middle income. That's the absolute minority. And I think we can present in our next meeting the number of different plans that are on the table of housing that will be coming on, affordable housing that will be coming online in the next three to four years. That'd be a helpful thing to do. Next, Maria. And Joe, aren't we, one of the uh, community boards that had the highest number of affordable housing or new developments coming up in yeah, our, borough our or in the city actually, actually has the highest number of rent new rents of rent stabilized units and that's directly related to the affordable housing production that happened through the rezonings of west chelsea and hudson yards and it's really made a major difference but i think it's time to be helpful for the public to see it we go through a review every twice a year of where we are in that process and the production of affordable housing we can do that at our next meeting. That's a good idea. Thank you. Randolph? I hope I pronounced it correctly. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, well, I've lived here for 22 years and... Can you just say where you live also, please? I live on 36th, um, directly across from the Double Tree. And, and next door to me is the, uh, is the veterans. So I'm sandwiched between the two um, shelters. So um, I just want to thank you guys and reiterate what everyone else has said. Um, but just like half said about being in, in your own home, 
and having no break from this um, with the constant radio playing, the constant guys just yelling to each other, the constant ambulances. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just no way to live. And, um, and just walking down the street, you kind of run the gauntlet, just trying to get from my apartment to the subway because I'm a working person. Um, and you have to walk through groups of guys that are milling around, selling drugs. We have scaffoldings everywhere, so they don't move aside. You have to walk through them. And if, if, if they have a mask on at all, it's, it's, it's around their chin or it's under their nose. Um, and, and they cough on you and they're smoking their cigarettes or their, or their marijuana and they're blowing it on you. So, you know, it's, it's just, um, you don't even feel safe walking down the street just from COVID. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm a guy, I don't worry about getting assaulted, but I mean, I guess that could happen too. Um, but just just fearful of um, for, for my health. So 30 seconds. Just want to thank you again for all, all you guys are doing. At least we have someone listening to us. Um, and is, is there any, uh, anything we can do, just let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, Brian, I'm going to give other people a chance to speak. Angela? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, my husband and I are on 37th Street between 8th and 9th, and um, I want to echo what so many people have said. I guess my biggest question is why is there zero policing? There's no policy to police these people. Um, my neighbor walked out and uh, to go across the street to the grocery store at 7.45 in the morning and is accosted, and uh, my husband takes goes out the window and takes a picture of someone shooting up. Um, it's just like, why is there no rules for these people? And, and there's rules for us. Uh, it, someone who's, who's normal, with, someone who's mentally ill has no rules. And I just like, where are the rules for the and, and our protection for the people who are living here in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know how to, I, I know you guys are doing your best. I, I don't know how to get this to the governor's office. I don't know how to get it to the mayor's office um, to change the dynamics. It's really scary time. That's all. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very Kat much. Catherine. There. Um, I, it's a perfect segue for me. You've written that excellent letter. I live on 36th between 8th and 9th, and you have written this wonderful letter. And I'm wondering how and whether you can deliver it in a more aggressive way. Is someone able to take it and actually go and sit in the mayor's office with that letter and just persist until it, if you have to be a pain and stay there and bother the the secretary or the assistant until you can just get some assurance that they might look at it because we can't get ahead. I mean, I have heard, I'm sure other people have heard that Corey Johnson has had emotional difficulties lately and isn't up to the job, stopped being running against de Blasio and he wanted to give his focus to the neighborhood. Well, he needs to be told to get on it. Uh, I've had great conversations with his team. They give me every reassurance I feel you know, happy and encouraged. And then I hear from others that nothing happens. You just, they just can't reach it. So I've had success in my experience with going down to city halls and sitting places with my documents politely and then giving them. And, and I'm wondering how you were going to be delivering that wonderful piece you wrote. I was just bowled over with the care you took and the thoughtfulness and that you've heard everyone. And so I thank you all. Thank well, you, Catherine. Thank you, thank you very much. City Hall is not even open, so we can't deliver anything in person. Everything we do, unfortunately, is now in this same kind of venue with Zoom. Um, I think I've had one meeting with City Hall since March, you know, in person. So um, the real issue here is we need to be more public, and I think that's what we've heard loud and clear from, from the broader public tonight. 
And that's, I think, the next way to go, really get this issue to a broader out in the media. That's what we keep hearing, which I think is a very good suggestion. Yeah, um, thank you. And Brian had his hand up. Um, I was going to give you one minute to speak, Brian. Oh, God, I always have my hand up. Uh, look, I, was that an I, accident? No, uh, it, it was. But listen, just uh, two quick things. Uh, Lucy's story about the man being shot up by the other man. Uh, I went to speak to Leslie Murphy the other day from our board. And mm -hmm. on my way, they were doing it again, uh, this time in the morning. So it, it hasn't changed. That's been, that happened two weeks ago, still happening today. Um, and I, I, I really appreciate the board for giving my neighbors an opportunity uh, to speak about this because, um, you know, no one knows where to turn. And, Brian, you have 30 seconds. Okay. And when we do turn somewhere, uh, we kind of feel like we're, the answers are deflective. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks for everything. I'm good. Thank you. Just want to know, thanks all the residents for coming tonight and being serious. And it is very hard for all of us on this committee. We know how bad it is, but it's very hard when we listen to it yet again to know what your lives are on a daily basis. So thank you for being there. And again, do not give up. We've been in much more difficult times in our neighborhood and we have gotten through it. So thank you so, so much. Um, Joe, I just wanted to wrap up with something on this topic and if you want to say something else. JD, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. Did I? Oh. Um, I, uh, listening to all the comments again tonight, I didn't count how many speakers there were, but I will. So, you know, I, I have to say that I feel infuriated and um, sometimes when I feel infuriated, I don't make sense. So I'm trying, you know, keeping myself level. And well, sometimes I also get emotional when I'm infuriated. Um, I have been involved in so many meetings, having so many conversations, and I have done walkthroughs. I haven't had the opportunity to do them with the speakers, uh, with DHS, but I know that DHS and the speaker's office did it. I've done it on my own with community members and with um, Carl Wilson. Uh, the last walkthrough I did on 36th Street was actually on Sunday. And um, I saw probably at least 15 people, including, a, and on the side of NICA, um, most of the people there looked high, including a child that looked about five years old. And you know that I work, if you don't know, I work in child welfare and I was just like, oh my God, what is this? Um, two people sitting on the floor by the Doubletree Hotel, right by the entrance. I spoke to security at the Pineapple, which is right beside, um, right beside um, the, the Doubletree. Um, it was just, I, I can't imagine living there. And the thing that I, the other thing that I just quickly want to share is that based on my experience with this issue and my own observations, the conversations, the meetings, it seems like there's a couple of issues and we've, we've spoken about all of them. Everyone else has spoken about them, but I just wanna highlight them. Um, the lack of um, assistance from the mayor's office, the speaker, NYB, uh, NYPD pulling back, um, extremely limited services that are happening in, at the shelter sites. Some people are saying there's no services for them. There's a little bit, very limited. It's not what it should be. Uh, for the populations that are there. Um, uh, also, I think it's also about the culture that the nonprofit providers have. Um, and I, I want to highlight the thing to me that's most significant and stands out is how this impacts the residents of the block. Um, uh, everything that they're saying, I, they're not overstating, they're not exaggerating, um, including from what I've heard from CB4 members who live in the community including like, for example, someone told me, I don't walk down that street anymore unless I'm with my husband. Um, and she just met along Ninth Avenue. So I just wanna highlight that this has serious impact on the permanent residents who live on the block. And I am glad and thankful and appreciative of everyone who spoke tonight. Um, keep coming back to our meetings. So picking up on the suggestion that we are specifically now it's a second letter from tonight calling for a meeting with our elected officials to respond to putting this together and putting a letter together and a letter that also has a series of bullets about here is what could be done. Here is what could be done. So, and then we'll circulate that via 
uh, email and synthesize all the comments from tonight. Hector? Get your hand up. Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted everybody to have their say before I jump back in again. Um, for those of that you don't know me, uh, I've, I've, uh, I'm, hey, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt Hector, but can you just keep it a little bit brief? Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm a disabled veteran. I'm also a resident of NYCHA. I've lived over here for over 25 years. Um, I'm also on a tennis association, both at Chelsea, and now I'm a resident of Fulton as well. So uh, what you folks are experiencing right now, we've had to deal with for many years with the homeless situation and the drug situation and the criminal activity. Um, one of the reasons I joined the, the housing uh, subcommittee here is because of uh, the issues that we deal with here and, and the city abroad. So to make things short, I basically support you all. And I hope, um, you know, uh, we're all doing what we can. Uh, and I'm glad we're, we're getting as much support as we can from the community in general. Uh, Maria and Joe and Betty and the rest of the crew here are, are doing our most best to try to, to uh, secure better lives for everybody. Um, I'm just hoping that in the future, you know, when uh, all is said and done and we hopefully come to some kind of resolution for uh, this homeless crisis that we're having in, in your communities, like 36th Street and some of the other locations, um, we take a really close look at the uh, Housing Authority and uh, NYCHA, especially, and uh, hopefully we can do something more direct and, and, and do some real impact, okay, on that. Because basically, Thank you, you can, Yeah, no problem. Thank you. So, so just, oh. a, just a quick can raise or nod of assent about the general idea of this letter from the members. But JD has his hand up. Yeah, Joe, I, I, I think you cannot make a motion, but I will make the motion. Yeah, yeah. Since you're a co-chair, I'd like to recommend, I'd like to propose that this committee write a letter to our elected uh, representative, Brad Holloman, uh, Corey Johnson, Dick Gottfried, uh, all of them uh, urging, uh, uh, requesting an immediate meeting to deal with a situation uh, in the West 30s that uh, needs immediate, immediate uh, solution. And I would, uh, and that they should meet with the community board leadership as, as soon as possible. Is there a second, I second to that? that? I second that, but I'd like to add that we uh, urge that we create a plan, a plan of action, because again, the immediate has to be front and center but we need to have the city create a plan. I, I, I'm talking specifically uh, to me about the situation in the upper 30s. Immediate. It's a crisis. Why don't, why don't we incorporate both? Because we have to talk about specific action steps to figure this out. So I think that sort of, is that, is that okay, Dolores and JD to tie it together? Sure, sure. Okay. But, but I really, I'm we, second that. we need to address the situation on 36 and 37th Street. This is a crisis. People are afraid to go out of their house. All committee members in favor of raising your hand or not, please. Any abstaining? Any opposed? Uh, Judith, what was your vote? I don't see you or hear you. Good. Yeah. Thank you. No, she's got a thumbs up. Thumbs okay. up. That passes. Thank you all very much. Maria, take us to the budget. Um, let's see. And, and to the public, thank you all for being here tonight. Yes, thank you everyone. Um, for the budget, we I sent out an email for everyone to look over the capital and exp expense request that we had. Um, and I got a few suggestions or ideas or what people think they would like to see as a priority. Um, so most of it is actually uh, Leslie Williams, I got Josephine, uh, Judith, Betty. Um, all of it has to do with for capital affordable housing. Um, for expense, it's uh, I, I see social services here. There's some services related to um, homelessness. Um, social services, family shelters, um, expanding mental health treatment, 
um, for those who have mental health issues and are, and are experiencing homelessness. Um, Betty actually suggested funding a study to establish a process for locating temporary shelter, shelter hotels so that a neighborhood or a few blocks like we have in this particular situation don't end up with such a high concentration um, over you know, overwhelming the residents of that block. Um, uh, let's see what else I wanted to share with you. Something that I also highlighted in the email that I think is important is um, the community needs assessment that um, we had uh, a group do for us. And just to, a, a reminder, uh, the four groups that um, the four groups that um, were viewed as having the highest need were teens and young adults needing employment. Okay. Older adults, especially non-native English speakers, needing services, um, needing uh, the folks in affordable housing, needing afford affordability in the community. And the fourth thing was folks that are homeless and or have mental health issues, um, the need for more services, and including family shelters. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that traditionally, um, the things that are, um, that we vote at, um, I'm having a little trouble here. But basically, the three top things that we usually focus on are affordable housing, neighborhood preservation, and air quality. Um, Joe, do you want yeah, to yeah. add anything? I think it's really important that we're in a budget cycle. Even though the budget is bad, we have to respond. Yeah. Um, what I would Thanks ask Maria, Maria and, I mean, uh, and uh, Nelly to send out to us our last year's uh, recommendation, which pretty much this was discussed in the land use committee too, it's the production of affordable housing at certain sites, such as Harborview in the West 50s, um, there's continued support for the MTA and DEP sites for supportive housing, for the slaughterhouse site for affordable housing, and for uh, affordable housing on West 52nd Street at 500 West 52 and 560 West 52. That has been in our budgets for a number of years, and as everybody knows, we put capital requests in because year after year, they eventually get done. And that's why we keep them on the budget. Dolores. So just to, so everyone on the committee knows, um, actually on our committee is the chair of the budget committee, Jessica. And yes, also on, the, on that committee is Maria and myself. So all of those items that have been longstanding uh, will continue to be budget requests. Um, but uh, many of you may have seen that there was a, in this month's packet, there was a survey they went out to the broad community because clearly COVID has highlighted some new things. And what we're looking to do is to get that input and incorporate it into the budget conversation, recognizing that there is going to be a, a shortage of funds, that there are cuts happening all over the place. We need to continue, as Joe said, keep these items still front and center that we've always advocated for. The top ones from this committee have been very specific projects on affordable housing, but they've also been on improvements within NYCHA. And then we also um, highlighted a lot of issues and concerns uh, for uh, um, prevention of homeless services and maintaining um, uh, programs that, uh, that, that keep people uh, from being homeless. homeless. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, sorry. It is late. It is late. So, so it, it, all to say is that these items will still be there. What we're trying to be, and Jessica, I don't want to steal your thunder, but what we're trying to do is to be thoughtful around new things that may have uh, come up and been highlighted from COVID and how to articulate that in this year's uh, requests. Did I miss anything, Jessica? That's terrific. I would just add for this committee, not, not specifically related to this year's budget requests, but the survey results have been quite robust. Uh, we've had over 180 people participate so far. I think Jesse is going to, I think it went out again just yesterday. Um, and so it could be about 180 numbers from earlier this week. And each committee, <clears throat> excuse me, will then get the feedback that community members have shared. Not surprisingly, homelessness um, in the preliminary results is at the very top of the list, not just in the categories where it seems most relevant, like health and human services, but also comes up again and again in parks and sanitation and all of the other areas. So we'll look to see how we can get those results back to help drive the work of this committee uh, going forward as well. So, so normally in the, in the budget phrase, it's called, we vote for continuing support for these number of affordable housing. Uh, developments and then continuing support 
on the expense side for the homeless, for the prevention issues and the mm -hmm. mental health issues that we've asked for before. And then anything else, we'll have one more go, right, Jessica, to be able to add anything else new. Or are we at the point where, where we really have no, no more time? The, well, the budget committee uh, will be meeting um, next week. So it would be really important to get any uh, feedback or recommendations from this group uh, now. Um, and then we will put that into the, to the meeting and, and bring everyone, synthesize all of the different task, uh, committee's recommendations. And then it, the hope is that this will be presented to the board um, with recommendations at the next meeting. But again, everyone should remember, this is for recommendations for next July's budget. So this is, this is a long way off. The mayor then puts together his plan. And then again, we have an opportunity to reflect on that. So- um, This is for fiscal year 22, July 1, 2021 to June 30, yeah. 2022. So Maria, I'd ask you to synthesize the comments you've gotten back so far. And then I think we've had a good discussion now two months in a row, continuing support on the affordable housing and some of the right. services. And then the new ones, we'll just, you can just put them in and we'll ask the budget committee to try to synthesize our, our committee's response. Is, is that okay, guys? Jessica? That would that sounds great to me, if, as long as everyone's comfortable with that. Um, I think these are longstanding commitments, as you said. Um, and only COVID has only exacerbated them, not, not. Exactly. Uh, Absolutely. It looks right, like so, PD has something. Yes. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, right. I think you need a vote. I think you need yeah. a vote on this. Yes, so can I, for, given that proposal, continue to support both on the capital and expense side and then Maria synthesizing their comments came from committee members and sent it to budget committee. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those against, opposed, anyone abstaining, anyone present and eligible to vote. Okay, it carries. Um, uh, given that, I think we've had another <sighs> packed full of emotion and uh, living in our neighborhood meeting. And I really thank Maria for you managing this because I had such a limited technology capacity tonight. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. So is there a motion to adjourn? Anybody? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye. Good night to the public.